five plus stone, but I hope um, what I share this evening will equally be um, an encouragement to you and a challenge. I've never wrestled a ball, thankfully. I don't think I would survive the sort of attack that Charlie will be speaking about uh, next week. But for those of you that have uh, never seen me or, or heard of me, you'll have already picked up that I'm a not a native of Kilkeel. Um, I was born in the middle of the 60s, which makes me uh, actually four days younger than George. Uh, our pastor is, is four days older. Sorry, I'm four days older than George. Um, but we're both 1965 um, models. And um, I was born over in England in, in Birmingham. And uh, when I look back, uh, born into you know, a traditional family, mother and father, um, brought up um, very well and you know, from a very young age was well aware of the, the right things that we should seek to do um, and also aware of the wrong choices that we can sometimes make. And so often our human nature chooses the wrong things. Uh, maybe whether they're more exciting or, or what, I'm not too sure. But the circumstances in our house changed dramatically um, for me at a very young age. Um, vaguely remember the details. When I was age, age seven, there was a knock on, on our door at home one afternoon and my uncle was at the door with the unfortunate news that my father at age 42 had suffered a massive heart attack where he worked and had passed away. So that just left me and my mom. As I say, I was an only child at that age. Big shock for me and obviously a, an even bigger shock at that stage for my mother. You know, looking back, I can't remember a huge amount. I can't say how I felt. I can't say even whether I, I really understood at that, that age of seven the, the exact nature of, as to what had happened and then what would um, come to to be normal in our house from that stage onwards. But I don't think, to be honest, I ever blame God. Quite often people have um, tragic circumstances and God is the first person that gets the blame. Well, I can't honestly say that I ever blamed God because at a very young age, um, I had no perception of God, no understanding of God. And I can honestly say, despite an attempt from my mom to send me to Sunday school at a very young age, I remember walking into a Methodist church, and this is nothing, if there's any Methodists in the congregation this evening, this is nothing personal. I remember walking into our local Methodist church and looking around the church building and thinking, this is not for me. And I ran home, and that was my only, my one and only time uh, visiting Sunday school and other than that I went back to two weddings of two of my um, cousins and at the age of 15 in high school uh, that was the sum total of any church experience um, that I had. There was no influence, uh, Christian influence in the school that I belonged to. Um, religious education at the school was very general and, and sought to cover every um, possibility that existed. So I can honestly say that my, my knowledge or my uh, expectations of, of God, who he was, um, was, was not founded on anything that I'd ever heard or been taught. So at, at early teenage years, I have to say that all I wanted to do was just fit in with the crowd. Didn't want to be the one that was gonna be different in any way, shape, or form. Generally, wherever the crowd went, I was happy to go along with the crowd. Um, and as I look back, the crowd on occasions were maybe involved in things that were good enough um, past the time of day. But equally, I can honestly say that there were a number of things that that crowd were involved in that when I look back on, I would be uh, disappointed with myself um, and well aware of a number of the, the bad choices that I sought uh, to make. And, and I say that um, because uh, so often when we hear testimonies, 
within the church, we can honestly look at it from, or now I suppose as a parent, I can look at it. We obviously love to think that we, we do the very best for, for our children and that our children are, in our own minds, little angels. Well, I have to t say, despite being you know, directed very well in those young years, a number of the things that I got up to uh, weren't because of things that, that came from home. They were because of the friendship group that I got myself involved in. But there was a big change, another big change ahead of me at 16 years of age. That, that final day in school where the, uh, the books got thrown in the bin and school was finished and work was about to start. Well, that was a big change for me because I remember having left school uh, during the, the summer holidays. Um, I, I got myself um, my first girlfriend who five years after that became my wife. She's still my wife, thankfully, and um, I started work. And very quickly, I, I lost touch with the friends uh, from school and started to make friendships and acquaintances with the guys at work. And I remember being at my, my girlfriend's house one Sunday afternoon, and the mother asked me what I thought at the time was a very strange question. She says, are you planning to go to church with Heidi this evening? Well, I had no plans to go back to church. As I say, my church involvement was at seven years of age and two weddings and really saw nothing there of relevance. Well, she said, quite often if you go to church, they'll feed you. Well, that's maybe not a bad bit of news for a 16-year-old. If you get fed quite often, I think you're willing to go places. So anyway, I decided that I would go along to the church. And it was a very different church to, I think, any of the church buildings in Kilkeel. There were no stained glass windows, there were no pews, there was no um, fancy building. Just individual chairs that were laid out in a small room, small hall. But something happened that first night that I found quite strange. The man opened up, as Andy did this evening, he said, let's just open in prayer. And for the first time ever, I heard a man talking to somebody that he knew, somebody that he was well acquainted with, and somebody that he was willing to give the glory and the praise to. The only prayers I had ever heard at 16 years of age were those that were read out from the, the book by the headmaster in the school. And the pronunciation and the wording was always very perfect in those books. But there was no, I, I never felt that there was anything in them. They were just words that were being said. But this man stood at the front of the church and he was speaking to somebody that he knew that he had a relationship with. And that started to get me thinking. So over the course of a few weeks, I was presented with a message that I had never, ever come across. Having never been to Sunday school, I was never told that God loved me. Having never been to Sunday school, I had never been told that the Lord Jesus Christ loved me enough to leave heaven and to come down and to live upon this earth, ultimately to die upon the cross at Calvary. Now, if you've been brought up with that, then you've become familiar with it. But let me tell you, at 16 years of age, if you've never heard that tremendous news, it rocks your world. It really does grip you and really forces you to, to start to stand up at 16 years of age and to try and work out whether what you're being told for the first time ever is truth. And the realisation was also of the fact that, that God had prepared a heaven above that was to be kept for those that trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we read the book of Revelation, we realize that there will be no sin in heaven. Now, I had heard for the first time, as I say, at 16, about the fact that we had sin within our lives. I've already talked about the, the friendship group that I was involved in. I didn't need any convincing that there was sin in my life. I was very clear with some of the things that I'd been involved in that, that, that I had sin in my life and that if heaven was real and God was real, that he had every right to basically refuse me entry 
into heaven, and that troubled me. So within a few weeks of starting to go along to the church, I was asked if I wanted to go on a, a holiday with the young people from the church. Um, and a minibus was hired, and they headed away, and there was a spare seat for me uh, on the minibus uh, to go to the Isle of Wight. So I spent a week with people just from the church. I had never had a friendship group um, that was like that to start with. As I say, a lot of the friends that I would have um, hung around with would have you know, spent quite a bit of their time maybe towards the weekends around the public houses where of where we lived. And all of a sudden, I, I was confronted with people that seemed to have so much excitement and there was no alcohol in view. So much excitement and joy and there wasn't a bad word being spoken. And this was something that was unfamiliar to me. And basically what it was that these people, Christians, had a reality of God living within them. They had a peace within them that they were on the road to heaven. And that basically they had the enjoyment of living day by day with the Lord Jesus Christ within them and leading them and guiding them. And I knew nothing of that. And that week spent on holiday was a real challenge to me that these people had something, and I'll be perfectly honest, it was something that I really felt that I needed to th seriously consider, that I wanted. I wanted to know that joy. I wanted to know that satisfaction. Because on the odd night that I went out with the lads uh, where I w uh, w lived, and we went to the pub and maybe came out with a sore head, you know, there was no satisfaction the following morning when you wake up feeling bad with them an awful taste in your mouth. There was nothing that the world had to offer me that could bring any level of satisfaction. And yet, while I was seen with that week's holiday, was something very, very different. Jesus had made the difference in their life. And I was beginning to realize the truth of that and being challenged when I look back by God. God starting to prepare me to seriously consider everything so it was the October of 1981 shortly after I was 16 that I was confronted one evening and felt that a decision had to be made and I can honestly say that that was the first night ever that I prayed to God and it wasn't the prayer asking God to forgive me for my sins and to cleanse me it was a prayer basically saying God if you are real I need you to give me one no one more night Give me one more opportunity to work this all out in my brain. And I'll come in the morning if I'm convinced. I prayed that prayer for seven nights. Every night. Worried that if anything happened to me that I was unprepared for heaven. Until Saturday the 31st of October 1981. I think it was the guilt at the end of it and the fear of the uncertainty of what would happen if death came. That I became a Christian. Very simply, no flashing lights, nothing extraordinary happened. But I simply acknowledged the sin that was in me and realized and called out for the Lord to forgive me for my sin and to come into my, into my life and basically to take control and to take charge of my life. And on that Saturday morning, he entered in and he saved me. No massive changes um, in terms of, of outwardly, but, but uh, so many changes that occurred very quickly within the, the, the bad language that I was accustomed to using with my normal friends. Thankfully, the Lord took that away from me very, very quickly. The desire to drink and a number of these things vanished very, very quickly. And I was convinced without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord had come and now dwelt uh, within me. The best decision that I ever made and a decision that I would honestly ask you to, to seriously consider this evening. We moved, we married in, in 1986 and we moved to Northern Ireland um, in, the, in June of 1989. I just want to share a couple of instances just to say to you that in trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, we're never guaranteed 
a walk in the park and a, and, a, and a rose garden. But what God does guarantee to each one of us is that we will never have to face uh, situations and troubles and difficulties on our own. Six weeks after we moved over from England, I was involved in a, managing a glass factory uh, in Kilkeel. And about four o'clock on the Friday afternoon, I had a, a very severe accident with a sheet of glass and ended up with um, the, uh, the ambulance blue lighting me down to, to Daisy Hill. I had severed three main tendons um, and muscles in my, my right arm, which required microsurgery. So I had the, the difficult situation of phoning my wife from a and &E, telling her not to panic down the road. I was okay that I'd cut my arm. And, and, and I have to say that I told my wife, because my mother was still living in England, and I have to apologize for, for lying on this occasion, that if she phoned, tell her that I was unable to take the phone call and I'd be in touch with her as soon as I could. It was before the mobile phone was, was available. And it was, it was when I got home and everything had been stitched back together that I actually called and told her that I'd had an accident. But that was one, one time where my faith was really tested. We were 100% confident that God was bringing us from England over to Northern Ireland. And six weeks after we came, that's the sort of thing sometimes that can, that can rock your faith. It tested my faith, but thankfully my faith was strong enough and the Lord's presence was real to me at that stage. And then one other incident, a little more recent in 2011, I found myself one um, Sunday morning with, with severe chest pains in the church and, um, and shortly after that down to A&E um, in Newry again um, and after a couple of tests had been done um, I was admitted to the coronary care um, department. I think to be honest because of the family history and my, my father passing away at 42 years of age, I was 46 at that stage, I never honestly expected that I would dodge a heart related problem in my life. I think I was always aware my, 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 my uncle had his first heart attack at 33. So it was in the family genes and it was something that I honestly expected would, would come at some stage but never really knew how severe it may or may not be. But I ended up in A&E and uh, the doctor came up, basically sat on the bed, talked to me and he says, well, to be honest, he said, we'll take the blood tests and we'll get the results. He said, I don't think you've had a heart attack. I don't even think it's heart-related pain. Well, three weeks later, I was back for a follow-up um, treadmill test and again had to stop the test um, and the same doctor was called back in uh, on that afternoon. And within two seconds of lifting the, the sheet of paper with the results on, he just looked at me uh, and Heidi was sitting next to me and he said, you've definitely got a problem in there. So that was the, the first time uh, in reality that we knew we were now dealing with something that wasn't a figment of my imagination and was probably a little bit more than indigestion that Heidi had always hoped that, that it was that and no, nothing any more seriously. But a week in hospital and I got transferred up to um, Craig Avon to the, um, the cath lab for an angiogram. Well, I just want to close with this thought. The first night in hospital, wife at home and two children um, and the reality that there's something wrong in here. Two o'clock in the morning, and I was wrestling in prayer with God. It was too late for me to turn around to God and say, look, I know I've been eating the wrong food, maybe for a few years, and I know I'm maybe carrying a bit too much weight, and the waistline's a bit too big. I was unable to try and make a deal with God. But I had to have an acceptance that what would be would be in my life. And the challenge I want to leave this evening as I finish is that simple reality. If you had that problem, if you had that diagnosis in your own circumstances, would you have that peace to know that your sins are forgiven, that heaven is a place that God has prepared for you? Or would you be lying there thinking, I need to try and bargain with God, I need more time? I had made my decision in 1981 
doesn't mean to say that that was an easy night. But thankfully, as I look back, God gave me a peace that night, and I spent a week in hospital and came through the treatment, have the stints in place, thankfully still doing what they're supposed to do, take the doctor's advice, take the tablets every morning. But a realization with the words of a chorus that we sing quite frequently in the church. For every day I have on earth is given by the king. That's a realization that the life that we, that we have this evening, the next breath that you take is because God is allowing it. But there will come a point in each person's life where God will say that that is the last breath that you will be given. I just want you to consider seriously, have you made that step? Have you made your peace with God? Have your sins been forgiven? Do you know you have peace with him? George will be speaking a little bit later on and sharing. We would just encourage you to listen very hard to realize that God's offer of salvation that I took in 1981 is still available to each one of you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. You know, the, there's two types of people, or three types of people in here tonight. Um, and you're all very welcome. One has a testimony. That's a person who's trusted the Lord Jesus as their saviour. The other one may have lost their testimony. Someone who, who's maybe here tonight and you're in a backslidden state. And then there's, there's others who don't have any testimony. You don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour yet. And perhaps tonight you'll come and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed Glenn's life. Jesus has changed many lives in this car park. Jesus can change your life. And as we sing our second hymn, perhaps maybe you just in the while we sing it, and maybe in the quietness of your own car, you'll just either come back to the Lord, thank him for your testimony. If you're a backslider, you come back to the Lord. Or if you've not known the Lord Jesus, maybe you'll trust him tonight as your Savior. We're going to sing our second hymn. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood.
Thank you very much indeed uh, to Glenn for, for his testimony this evening and also to thank Andy for, his, for leading the service for us. Now if you have a copy of God's Word with you in your car tonight, we're turning to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 16. The Acts of the Apostles, please, chapter number 16. And we're coming to a very familiar portion of the Word of God tonight. It's coming to the conversion of the Philippian jailer. And we begin a story this evening in Acts 16 and verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, that's upon Paul and Silas, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises, Unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, and so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and every one's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors opened, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he sat meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Amen. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious truth. I want tonight to begin by asking you a question. What will it take tonight for God to do to get your attention? What will it take tonight for God to get your attention? What will it take this evening for God to do in order for you to listen? Because you know, friends, sometimes God has to do terrible things to get our attention. The reason for that is that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yesterday evening, I just asked myself this question. I wonder did William Dunlop, before he got on that motorcycle, I wonder did he think, I wonder did he consider that if he was to be killed in that practice race, where will he be in eternity? Young lad of 32. And I wonder when he got on the bike yesterday, little did he think that that was the final, the final takeoff that would usher him into eternity. On Wednesday afternoon, I have another funeral to attend. A young man of just 29 years of age, killed tragically in a tractor accident. And you know, friend, tonight we need to be sure that if death was to come to you, 
that you know where you're going and that you know what will happen to you whenever death comes. You see, friend, death will come tonight, but, but we need to consider tonight where we will go when eternity, when death comes. You see, the Bible makes it very clear tonight. The Bible makes it very clear that the only hope tonight that we have when we die is in God's wonderful salvation. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but not everybody wants to go to heaven God's way. And tonight I want to bring you this closing message that, the God, that God has given to me here this evening. And tonight I want to bring you to one man, one man who found hope and who put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we meet this man tonight, he's known as the Philippian jailer. As we meet him tonight, he was a rebellious man. He was a man tonight who had no thought for God. He had no thought or concern for his own soul. And here's a man tonight who, who lived the way so many live today. No thought for God. No thought for the gospel, no thought for the very servants of God. Do you know what I've discovered? That many people are like him tonight who go through life with no concern. My friend tonight, you need to be concerned. You need tonight to be concerned about your soul. You need to be concerned tonight about the moment when you will stand before God. There's no getting away from it. There's no escaping it. There's no getting out of it. The Bible says we all must stand before God. And here in this story tonight, this passage, we have a stone-cold-faced jailer who had no time for God. No time for the servants of God and certainly no concern for himself. You know, sometimes, child of God, the toughest people are the religious people. And I wonder this evening, are you one of those people? You have time for the church but no time for the gospel. You have respect for the clergy but no thought for your soul. And there's many in the kingdom of mourn like that tonight. Time for church, but no time for the cross. Time for the clergy, but no time for Christ. And here's this man tonight. One minute to midnight, he had no time nor no thought for God. You know, friend, this evening, here's a rebellious man tonight. Here's a man tonight, like so many. But you know, friend, God took a dealing with this man. Because what we read in that passage was that God sent an earthquake. And there's nobody tonight too hard that the Lord cannot bend and the Lord cannot break. As I have said, God sometimes has to do terrible things to get our attention. Because God doesn't want you to perish tonight. God loves you. In spite of our sins, in spite of the lives that we live, God loves us. An old preacher of a bygone day called Billy Sunday once said, God can use many things to melt our hearts. God can use many things to bend us. And sometimes God even has to put a coffin on our backs in order to get us to bend. 
I don't know how many times God had to do terrible things to people to get people to listen. In the book of Job, chapter 9, verse 4, we read these words, Who hath hardened himself against the Almighty and hath prospered? And tonight, my dear friend, some of us are saved the hard way. You're here tonight. You know the gospel. You know the gospel inside out. But some of these days, God might have to do something terrible to bring you to himself. Here in this chapter today, God sent an earthquake. And God might have to send an earthquake into your health, love. I don't know how many people tonight had no time for God until one morning they discovered a wee lump. And I can tell you they were soon awakened when they discovered a wee lump. And they went to the doctors and I'll tell you, they believed in prayer then all right. Sometimes God sends different trials, friends. And you know, friend, sometimes God does terrible things. There's a man who lived not so very far from where I worked in my last job. He had the name, same name as myself, George. And he had a brother called David. And David was dying with cancer. But David in the hospital got saved. He trusted the Lord Jesus as a savior. But when David passed away, they, they brought the remains home to George's house. And when the undertakers were wheeling the coffin up the, up the hall in David's home. God spoke to George. And this is what he said. If this was your coffin, where would you be now? Your brother's in heaven. And if you ever want to see him again, you're going to have to trust my son the way he trusted my son. When the undertakers took the lid off and prepared his brother for viewing, and George went into the bedroom and put everybody out and got down at the side of the coffin and trusted the Savior. To this day, George would tell me it took God to bring a coffin into his home in order to get through to him. And sometimes God has to bring coffins into our home to get through to us. I could take you to another home tonight, outside Bamburg, to a man who was spoken to for over 11 years and he wouldn't give in, he wouldn't give in under the power of conviction until his wee son, his wee son just 11, was killed in a tragic car accident. And his wee son that summer, his wee son that summer trusted the Lord at a, ba at a holiday Bible club. And do you know what that man would tell you tonight? That man would tell you, you know, friend, it was through the death of my wee boy that God really had to break me. You know, friend, God can do terrible things because he loves you. And he wants to save you tonight. But friend, don't let God have to call you the hard way and the painful way. And friend, this evening, this man tonight, he was a rebellious man. He, he was a tough man. Ah, but listen to what we read. He came trembling. He came trembling. He was a man that was troubled. Now he was a man that was terrified and he came. And this man, the rebellion man, now is now, now the requesting man. He comes to Paul and Silas and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? One moment. One minute before midnight, he had no, no thought for God. 
But you know the sad thing about this man tonight? At 12 o'clock, this man was about to take his own life because he believed he was at the end of the road. He believed there was nothing else for him. He believed there was no other way. How many people they come to that place in life? They believe there's no hope. They believe there's no future. They believe life isn't worth living. But Paul and Silas was just there at the right moment and at the right time because God had them there. And Paul shouts, do thyself no harm. We're all here. You know, friend, tonight, we are here because God has brought us here. You're here tonight because God has brought you here. Because we are here to tell you tonight the same message that this man heard. You know what the message is tonight? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the message. Don't believe in the Baptist church. Don't believe in the Presbyterian church. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He is the Savior tonight. He's the one they crucified to the cross. He's the one that was made sin for us. He was the one that was wounded for our transgressions. He was the one that was bruised for our iniquities. He was the one that took our place on that old rugged blood-stained cross at Calvary. And friend, there's no other Savior tonight. No other Savior. Only the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. And the crucified Lord Jesus took your place. And there he shed his blood. And there he became the sin offering for the world. And he shed his blood and he died. But on the third day he rose again and tonight he's a living Savior. Let me tell you the Lord Jesus Christ is a living Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is not a religion. He's a living Savior. Friend, I'm saved 32, hang on, 33 years coming. 33 years. And it wasn't religion that did anything for me. For the Lord Jesus is not a religion, he's a reality. And tonight, friend, you too can be saved. And you too must be saved. Because neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby, whereby ye must, ye must be saved. And you know, friend, this, this requesting man now becomes a receiving man. For there on his knees, trembling in the prison, he trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And friend, that's what you have to do tonight. Friend, you have to trust the Savior. You have to come to him just the way you are. And praise God, you can come. And there's room at the cross for you tonight. And you can come to him. You can come just the way I came. I came to Jesus as I was. Not in a shirt and tie. I came in an old khaki jumper and a pair of jeans on me and a pair of Dr. Martin boots. I came, that's the way I came. I came to Jesus as I was, weary, worn, and sad. But I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. But friend, tonight you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved tonight. And here's one truth you have to believe before you believe anything. You have to believe that you're a sinner. You have to believe that you're lost. Because, friend, tonight, unless you believe that you're lost, you'll never be found. 
And tonight I want you to know that the Bible says we all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. But Christ died for you and Christ died for me to save you tonight and to save me from our sin and from a Christless hell. But I want to finish this story tonight and I want to finish God's message. This rebellious man became the requesting man who became the receiving man. Ah, oh, but glory to God, he, he became the rejoicing man. Friend, this man was rejoicing because of what Christ did for him. It tells us there in the story, he rejoiced with all his house. He wasn't going about moping and gloping. Do you know some Christians disappoint me when you see them going about with faces like a lurking spade. I'm glad I'm saved. I can tell you the Lord Jesus. Man, he'll put a smile in your face you never had before. He'll put a song in your heart you never had before. And that's the joy that Jesus brings. Do you know what I can say tonight? I tried the broken system, but all the waters failed. And even as I stoop to drink, they mock me as I will. But none but Christ can satisfy. None other name for me. There's love and there's life and there's lasting joy. Lord Jesus found in thee. And you know, friends, like you can have this peace. You can have this joy. You can have this life that has a capital L. Ah, oh, but friend, if you'd only come tonight, come. But be careful. Be careful. Because God won't allow you to go to hell too easily. And God may have to do things to get you to listen. W.P. Nicholson says sometimes we're so hard. The only way God can get us to look up is to put us on the broad of our back. And you know, friend, God's bigger than what you are and God's bigger than me. And friend, why don't you come tonight? Come the easy way. God loves you tonight. Christ died for you tonight. And I believe God is speaking to you tonight. Ah, but here, will you come tonight? You must come as a poor, pathetic, lost sinner. If you come tonight, Christ will receive you. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And the Lord Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How shall we escape tonight if we neglect so great salvation? And I'm finished. But this is what I want to ask tonight. What will it take for God to get your attention? And what will it take God to do to bend you under the power of conviction of sin? What will God have to do to bring you to that place of repentance? I pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will do his work in his heart now upon you. And if you'll feel the tugging power of God, the Holy Ghost, as he convicts you of your sin now in that car, and under the mighty power of God, that he'll give you the grace to come out tonight. And if you'll come and receive him into your heart by faith, and know tonight that all is well with your soul. If you come tonight, let's pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I leave the eternal issues now of this service to thee. And praying, O oh God, tonight, that thou will do that work in the heart and in the soul and in the conscious and in the mind that needs to be done. And Lord, in wrath, you will, you will remember mercy and give the saving grace, we pray, in our Savior's name. Amen. We're going to close.
with the final hymn on the hymn sheet tonight, Sinner, or, yes, a Sinner, how, how thy heart is troubled. God is coming, he's coming very near. Do not hide thy deep emo emotion. Do not check that, that falling tear. Friend, don't. You come tonight now. Come. Oh, be saved. His grace is free. Oh, be saved. He died for thee. And after we sing this hymn, we're going to have one more prayer. And then we'll head for home, please. Number three on the hymn sheet. Thank you. Sing with holy rapture, or or no, another soul forgiven. May you tonight give the angels in heaven cause to rejoice over coming to the Lord Jesus tonight. May you let the angels bear the tidings of your soul been saved tonight. Let's think of these words now as we sing them. The last verse, please. Let the angels bear the tidings of one true. simply that tonight, oh be saved, he died for thee, You're, you have no excuse tonight, all has been done, and I pray tonight, earnestly pray under the providence of God and the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that tonight he will give you that grace to believe, and that grace to come, don't leave it till tomorrow. For none of us are to boast of tomorrow. For nobody knows what tomorrow may bring forth for anybody. And that's why the Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the time of the day of salvation. And I'm here to help you in any way I can. And please come and speak with us. We're not here to force you into anything. But if we can be of any help, please feel free to come. 
Lord, tonight we know that you've been speaking, Lord. And for those who have heard thy voice tonight, give them grace tonight to believe and to receive. And may this very blockyard on this very night be the birthplace for some poor lost soul tonight. Part us in thy fear and with thy blessing and take us to our homes in safety. And for any tonight who would like to speak, give them the grace to do so. We commend ourselves into thy care and into thy keeping in our wonderful Saviour's name. Amen. I want to thank you all so much indeed tonight for coming along. It's lovely to see you and it's been lovely to have you tonight. Remember, we're here next week. It's a testimony you do not want to miss. And uh, so please do come uh, here same time, same place next week. We'll be glad to see you, glad to have you again. And we trust you'll have a blessed week ahead. And if there's anybody would like to speak to us, please come and, and talk to us. If you have something on your heart, don't be afraid to come. So everyone, God bless, safe home, and we trust that you'll have a blessed evening for whatever's